that his new recruits who challenged him on his quality of leadership, the survivor retaliated fire for fire, letting them understand that he was not their enemy, that their focus should have been on the plutonian and his super allies. Listening to him, some of his recruits who chased after him decided to follow him to fight the plutonian and his super allies, for the survivor was furious and went on the chase after the plutonian. But to their amazement, the plutonian and his super allies had gone, taking with them some of the new recruits forcefully without making a sound. It was like they were not even there. Still losing hope in the survivor's quality of leadership, for sincerely, it wasn't anything to write home about. They questioned him on their safety and how he is going to assure them that he was capable of taking care of the plutonian, for he took the rest of their member without making a sound. In fact, how are they so sure that he is not watching them right now? In irritation, the survivor blasted one of his recruits with his energy blast, letting them know that it was a big mistake in recruiting them, for they are nothing but cowards and losers, and that the only reason he recruited them was because the original members deserted the group. And most importantly, he wonders where in the blue hell Kaidan is on the moon. The Plutonian and his super allies were using the new recruits to the Paradigm as slingshot projectile in space, as the Plutonian asked his allies to make a wish. The only person who had nothing to wish for was Kota, confessing to the Plutonian that she had nothing in mind at the moment. The Plutonian, who was in a joyous mood for the first time, told her not to worry, for they have got all night. As he took one of the pleading new recruits, flung and swung him into space and asked Kota to make a wish. The acting president Ulik was in an emotional turmoil as everything around him was crashing down before his eyes as his grip and power was void and null. The country as it stands was financially and economically unstable as he got a phone call that he had some non-scheduled guests in his office. They were representatives of the Chinese-Japan Anti-Plutonian Coalition and the names of these individuals were Mr. Shin Chan, the wealthiest man from the Eastern Hemisphere and Mr. Nitoku, who was part of the Japan military industrial complex. The representatives from the Eastern Hemisphere made the acting president understand that their agreement to work together in peace and unity in which will facilitate in helping each other to rebuild their infrastructure was off the table. And the reason is because his country was not financially buoyant enough to contribute to the development needed internationally and not in the League of Countries with resources to help in a developing effort. Enraged at the representatives, the acting president stood his ground that a deal is a deal and it must be honored as agreed for his country wouldn't go down without a fight. But the representatives didn't bulge for they made the acting president know that the Russians at the moment are assembling nuclear arsenals all over the world to strike at the plutonian whenever he strikes, in which the president believes that the Russians will fail and the representatives equally agree to that notion. Well, the representatives of the Eastern Hemisphere were not just in his office to talk about their shaky deal, but they were offering the acting president a scrupulous deal. You see, when superhuman started to reveal themselves to the world, mostly in America, the Eastern Hemisphere came together secretly on a secret contingent of theirs, just in case a day like this comes when an entity like the Plutonian goes rogue. For there was an endgame weapon for them to activate, but before they can do this, in respect, they needed the West to agree for this protocol to pass through for the activation of the endgame weapon. The problem with the end game weapon is that if and when activated, it will cause some sacrifice to humanity in which will result in the termination of one third of the world population. As they asked the acting president if he is willing and has the guts in sacrificing one third of the population to save two third of the population of the world. While the world is going ablaze, Bettinor decided to surround herself with fleets of fit and muscular men, patting and 
herself away, leaving behind her ex-husband Gilgamesh and her friends the Paradigm, not caring for a thing in the world. But shockingly, she was met with a surprise, a visit from the Plutonian, and Cutter was with him. Expecting the worst from the angry Plutonian and believing her end was nigh, she let the Plutonian know that she had been waiting for this day and she was the one who shot at him, trying to kill him but for the sake of Cubit, who circumvented the bullet to save his life because Cubit, for some reason, best known to him, believes the Plutonian is redeemable and deserves a second chance. As she bravely stood and waited for the Plutonian to strike her, she was surprisingly met with a kiss from the Plutonian and despite her betrayal to him, the Plutonian still loves Betinor, which angered Cutter, whom struck the Plutonian from behind, in which the Plutonian busted and laughed, and they took Betinor with them. Now remember Kaidan was held captive by her zombified boyfriend, Sila, who is neither alive or dead, and also been under the control and influence of Modius. Well, she escaped, and found her way to Gilgamesh, who doesn't want to be found, and wasn't happy to see her, for she was a reminder of his long-lost wife. Betinor, and since then he had kept himself. But Kaidan at this time needed him as she explained how she escaped her zombified boyfriend Sila. She could have escaped, but Modius, who was very smart and understand how her powers work, strapped around her neck a device which scrabbled her thoughts and her speech. So she was unable to conjure spirits to come to her aid. But in the end, she circumvented the device by keeping a focus on the spirit of Sila in a way to draw him into the afterlife in which made zombified Sila and spirited Sila to be in contention with each other as the battle emerged between the two for existence and dominance. Kaidan, observing that the zombified Sila was gaining ground, tried a possible best to conjure the spirit of Sila to full existence, but it wasn't enough. Not even their shared bond of love was held Helping. As zombified Sila was overcoming spirited Sila due to the weakness of Kaidan's power. So Kaidan decided to do the inevitable by killing zombified Sila with a large rock hitting him behind the head. Then she removed the collar of her neck and made for her escape. Now she needs Gilgamesh's help, but a heartbroken Gilgamesh was still hot. For a life without Betinor was devastating for him, telling Kaidan to seek help somewhere else. But Kaidan Kaidan made him understand that he was the only person left she could turn to for help, as Cubit is nowhere to be found, Volt is dead, Betinor is gone, and Charibis, alias the survivor, had become the new Plutonian, if possible, worse. Suddenly, to the shock of Gilgamesh, a spirited Sila appeared, telling Gilgamesh that the earth is on the brink of destruction, that while he was dead, he saw a lot of things which may or may not come to pass, and that his brother Charibis, alias the survivor, is more dangerous than the Plutonian, for his ego might push him to make the wrong move, and this might cause a lot of lies, him included, but that there is an information that he and his brother never revealed to the Paradigm, and the information is a way to reduce the survival powers and the truth is that him and Charlie Beast ally as the survivor are not just twins but triplets <laughs>